As for the gold which they wear for beauty, they will not shine unless someone wipes off the rust, for even when they were being cast, they had no feeling. They were bought at any cost, but there is no breath in them. Having no feet, they are carried on men's shoulders, revealing to mankind their worthlessness. And those who serve them are ashamed, because through them these gods are made to stand, lest they fall to the ground. If anyone sets one of them upright, it cannot move of itself. And, and if it is tipped over, it cannot straighten itself. But gifts are placed before them, just as before the dead. The priests sell the sacrifices that are offered to these gods and use the money. And likewise, their wives preserve some with salt, but give none to the poor or helpless. Sacrifices to them may be touched by women in menstruation or at childbirth. Since you know by these things that they are not gods, do not fear them. For why should they be called gods? Women serve meals for gods of silver and gold and wood. And in their temples, the priests sit with their clothes torn, their heads and beards shaved, and their heads uncovered. They howl and shout before their gods, as some do at funeral feasts, for a man who has died. The priests take some of their clothing of their gods to clothe their wives and children. Whether one does evil to them or good, they will not be able to repay it. They cannot set up a king or depose one. Likewise, they are not able to give either wealth or money. If one makes a vow to them and does not keep it, they will not require it. They cannot save a man from death or rescue the weak from the strong. They cannot restore sight to a blind man. They cannot rescue a man who is in distress. They cannot take pity on a widow or do good to an orphan. These things that are made of wood and overlaid with gold and silver are like stones from the mountain, and those who serve them will be put to shame. Why then must anyone think that they are gods or call them gods? Besides, even the Chaldeans themselves dishonor them. For when they see a mute man who cannot speak, they bring him and pray Bel that the, that the man may speak, as though Bel were able to understand. Yet they themselves cannot perceive this and abandon them, for they have no sense. And the women, with cords about them, sit along the passageways, burning bran for incense. And when one of them is led off by one of the passerby and is lain with, she derides the women next to her, because she was not as attractive as herself, and her cord was not broken. Whatever is done for them is false. Why then must anyone think that they are gods, or call them gods? They are made by carpenters and goldsmiths. They can be nothing but what the craftsmen wish them to be. The men that make them will certainly not live very long themselves. How then can the things that are made by them be gods? They have left only lies and reproach for those who come after. For when war or calamity comes upon them, the priests consult together as to where they can hide themselves and their gods. How then can one fail to see that these are not gods, for they cannot save themselves from war or calamity? Since they are made of wood and overlaid with gold and silver, it will afterward be known that they are false. It will be manifest to all the nations and kings that they are not gods, but the work of men's hands, and that there is no work for God in them. Who then can fail to know that they are not gods? For they cannot set up a king over a country or give reign to men. They cannot judge their own cause or deliver one who is wronged, for they have no power. They are like crows between heaven and earth. When fire breaks out in a temple of wooden gods, overlaid with gold or silver, their priests will flee and escape, but the gods will be burned in two like beams. Besides, they can offer no resistance to a king or any enemies. Why then must anyone admit or think that they are gods? Gods made of wood and overlaid with silver and gold are not able to save themselves from thieves and robbers. Strong men will strip them of their gold and silver and of the robes they wear, and go off with this booty, and they will not be able to keep themselves, not be able to help themselves. So it is better to be a king who shows his courage, or a household utensil that serves its owner's need, than to be these false gods. Better even the door of a house that protects its contents than these false gods. Better also a wooden pillar in a palace than these false gods. 
For sun and moon and stars, shining and sent forth for service, are obedient. So also the lightning, when it flashes, is widely seen, and the wind likewise blows in every land. When God commands the clouds to go over the whole world, they carry out his command, and the fire sent from above to consume mountains and wood does what it is ordered. But these idols are not to be compared with them in appearance or power. Therefore, one must not think that they are gods, nor call them gods, for they are not able either to decide a case or to do good to men. Since you know then that they are not gods, do not fear them. For they can neither curse nor bless kings. They cannot show signs in the heavens and among the nations, or shine like the sun, or give light like the moon. The wild beasts are better than they are, for they can flee to cover and help themselves. So we have no evidence, whatever that they are gods, therefore do not fear them. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber bed that guards nothing, so are their gods of wood overlaid with gold and silver. In the same way, their gods of wood overlaid with gold and silver are like a thorn bush in a garden on which every bird sits or like a dead body cast out in the darkness by the purple and linen that rot upon them you will know that they are not gods, and they will finally themselves be consumed and be a reproach in the land. Better, therefore, is a just man who has no idols, for he will be far from reproach. Do not commit a sin twice. Even for one, you will not go unpunished. Do not say, he will consider the multitude of my gifts, and when I make an offering to the Most High, God will accept it. Do not be faint-hearted in your prayer, nor neglect to give alms. Do not ridicule a man who is bitter in soul, for there is one who abases and exalts. Do not devise a lie against your brother, nor do the like to a friend. Refuse to utter any lie, for the habit of lying serves no good. Do not prattle in the assembly of the elders, nor repeat yourself in your prayer. Do not hate toilsome labor or farm work, which were created by the Most High. Do not count yourself among the crowd of sinners. Remember that wrath does not delay. Humble yourself greatly, for the punishment of the ungodly is fire and worms. Do not exchange a friend for money, or a real brother for the gold of Ophir. Do not deprive yourself of a wise and good wife, for her charm is worth more than gold. Do not abuse a servant who performs his work faithfully, or a hired laborer who devotes himself to you. Let your soul love an intelligent servant. Do not withhold from him his freedom. Do you have cattle? Look after them. If they are profitable to you, keep them. Do you have children? Discipline them and make them obedient from their youth. Do you have daughters? Be concerned for their chastity and do not show yourself too indulgent with them. Give a daughter in marriage. You will have finished a great task, but give her to a man of understanding. If you have a wife who pleases you, do not cast her out, but do not trust yourself to one whom you detest. With all your heart, honor your father, and do not forget the birth pangs of your mother. Remember that through your parents you were born, and what can you give back to them that equals their gift to you? With all your soul, fear the Lord, and honor his priests. With all your might, love your maker, and do not forsake his ministers. Fear the Lord, and honor the priest and give him his portion, as is commanded you. The first fruits, the guilt offering, the gift of the shoulders, the sacrifice of sanctification, and the first fruits of the holy things. Stretch forth your hand to the poor, so that your blessing may be complete. Give graciously to all the living, and withhold not kindness from the dead. Do not fail those who weep, but mourn with those who mourn. Do not shrink from visiting a, a sick man, because for such deeds you will be loved. In all you do, remember the end of your life, and then you will never sin. Therefore, my brethren, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in this way in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eudoia and entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And I also ask you, who are a true co-worker, help these women for they have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
Again, I will say, rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me, and you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I complain of want, for I have learned, in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and want. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you, for even in Thessalonica you sent me help once and again, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit which increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am filled, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. As parents and caring adults, we try to preserve the innocence of our children as long as possible. In our role as protectors, we may forget that we too need protection from things that are, at best, of no benefit to the salvation of our souls, and at worst, deadly. Oftentimes, we either don't know or don't believe that we are always under attack and being tempted by Saint Satan. That's why St. Paul reminds the Philippians in his closing words to them to stay focused on the things of God, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. Think about these things. It's an enormously difficult task in a culture that prides itself on instant access to almost anything. Satan longs to see the destruction of as many souls as possible and will use whatever means necessary to accomplish this task. We must remember that each one of us is a child of God, made in his image and likeness and a temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to be as diligent at guarding ourselves as we are as of our children. If it seems an impossible task, remember St. Paul's words, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. What is one way that you can practice, cu practice custody of the census today?